I więc e, ruszamy na pierwszy wykład inauguracyjny, który będzie przeprowadzony przez doktora Jima Bicia z Uniwersytetu w Angielskim Northamptonie. Niestety doktor Bicz e, nie mogą e, dotarnąć do Ciesina z powodów obostrzeń e, związanych z COVID-em, ale żyjemy w dobie digitalnej, to znaczy, że i tak się możemy z Jimem połączyć. Jim przygotował swoją konferencję w formie cyfrowej i więc możemy ją odwiedzić przynajmniej w ten sposób. Doktor Bicz się zajmuje przede wszystkim wywiadem brytyjskim podczas I wojny światowej i w tym kierunku badaczem opublikował monografię na temat Hague's Intelligence, to znaczy wywiad generała Douglasa Hague'a, to znaczy brytyjski wywiad na froncie zachodnim. Podczas swych badań się zapoznał także z postacią tego kapitana Jamesa Aleksandra Roye i to jest właśnie ten łącznik, który go łączy z Cieszyniem i w obecnej chwili doktor Bicz pisze monografię Jamesa Lang Aleksandra Roye i w tej monografii wiadomo także będą cięć i kawałki, które będą dotyczyć jego życia tutaj w Cieszynie jako członka tej międzysojężniczej komisji. Więc y, teraz daję słowo Irenie i Irena będzie prowadzić już tym panelem. To dziękuję bardzo jeszcze raz, że Państwo jest tu z nami. Czyli teraz, teraz Państwo wysłuchają wykładu Pana Jima Bicza w języku angielskim i mam nadzieję, że fantastycznie nam to wszystko pójdzie. O. Never heard it. the British Antation. Hello. My name is Jim Beach, and I am a British academic. I am also a military and intelligence historian. Thank you for inviting me to give the opening paper for this conference. I am also very sorry that I cannot be with you in person because the COVID situation has made that impossible. But I hope that I will be able to travel to Silesia sometime in the future. I also wish to thank Thomas Rusek and Andre Kolar for their help in researching this subject. My interest in the British Intention happened accidentally, and last year I published this article on the officers who were sent to the Duchy. The Historica, art Historica article is open access and can be downloaded for free. My paper today is based on a chapter which I understand will be published soon. The quote in my title is a famous one. When explaining his conduct at the peace conference to the British Parliament, David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, used the Duchy of Teschen as an example of the complex politics of Central Europe after the First World War. Since then, his words have been cited by many historians to illustrate the unpreparedness of the Western Allies to deal with the complex problems of Central Europe. In this paper, I will explain how the British had to quickly learn about Teschen and how that affected their policy choices. The paper is in two parts. The first part looks at British knowledge of Teschen before the Seven Day War in late January 1919 and how it may have affected policy. The second looks at British knowledge and policy after that conflict up to March 1919 the point at which the Western Allies' policy on Teschen stabilised. Following the Western Front armistice, the British began preparing for the forthcoming Paris Peace Conference. In order to assist the British delegation of diplomats and military officers, the Foreign Office produced 174 handbooks about various places and issues. They were written by experts and were used mainly by junior officials in preparing briefs for higher level decision makers. Teschen is included in a 35-page handbook entitled Austrian Silesia, which was published in January 1919. It highlighted the strategic importance of Teschen because of the intersection of major railway lines. It also stressed the economic importance of the Duchy's coal mines. The handbook explained the distribution of Czechs, Poles and Germans, but it did not suggest that this would be an area of future ethnic conflict. 
So we can conclude that the British did have some useful background information on the duchy. Much more important in explaining British perceptions of Teshin is this document. I will therefore explain its contents and its significance. As you can see, on the top right, the document has a CX stamp. <laughs> this means that it is a report received from Britain's Secret Service. The report summarises what a British officer discovered when he visited Teshin just after Christmas 1918. We know from other sources that there was at least one British Secret Service officer in Bohemia at this time, but he was not the author of the report because he was, a pra he was at Prague when the visit took place. Because it is a Secret Service report, the document is unsigned. But thanks to the excellent work of Thomas Rousseau, we know for definite that the report was written by Major George Crossfield. He was the first British officer to arrive in Prague in mid-November. He was not a Secret Service officer, but an Air Force officer who had been sent to look for airfields that could be used by British bombers to attack Germany. However, Germany signed the armistice before he arrived and the mission was no longer needed. But he stayed in Prague rather than returning to the West. Crossfield was from a wealthy business family that had pre-war connections to Bohemia and he was very pro-Czech. It is unclear whether Crossfield had any orders from London, but he did become very active in liaising with the Czechoslovak authorities and representing Britain at important events. And because he was senior in rank to the Secret Service officer, who arrived in mid-December, Crossfield became Britain's de facto representative on the ground, a sort of self-declared military attaché. In response to a request for information from London about the situation there, Crossfield went to the Duchy of Teschen, but he only went as far as Marisch Ostrau. He did not visit the Polish-held part of the duchy and only spoke to Czechs and Germans. On his return to Prague, the report was sent, probably by Secret Service courier, back to London. There, the Secret Service almost certainly passed it to the Political Intelligence Department of the Foreign Office. The Political Intelligence Department did analysis on complicated transnational subjects. The head of that department was Sir William Tyrrell, a senior British diplomat. Tyrrell would have already known about Silesia because he was close friends with a German Silesian aristocrat who owned Radun Castle. Tyrrell went to Paris as a member of the British delegation and you can see his signature on the top left of the report. As the crisis that became the Seven Day War unfolded, it appears that Tyrrell got a copy of this report sent from London to Paris. It was then circulated to other senior British diplomats and their names appear top right. The report is over a thousand words long and it will appear in full as an appendix to my forthcoming chapter. But the most obvious thing about it, it is, is that it is very pro-Czech in regard to Czech Teshin. For example, it claims that Teshin only contained 30,000 real Poles. It also suggests courses of action that actually happened at the start of the Seven Day War. On the slide, you can see an edited version of the report's final paragraph which says that if Entente officers told the Polish commander to withdraw, he would do so. Crossfield wrote that the Polish force is 2,000. The opinion of Major Bihal is that if a duly accredited Entente officer orders Brigadier Lasnik in the name of the Entente to retire his troops to Poland, he will do so. There will be no bloodshed and no time for sabotage. I am of the opinion that the danger of increasing Bolshevism in East Silesia is very real 
and that no time should be lost in the Czechs occupying it. Later, Crossfield was one of the Entente officers, probably the leading one, who tried to bluff the Polish commander. But his expectation of Latin's reaction was very wrong. However, the most important thing about this biased report is that it appears to be the only significant intelligence the British had about the situation in Teshin. And it was circulated amongst senior British decision makers just as the Seven Day War was about to start. From the 23rd of January, as the crisis unfolded in Teshin, the next injection of information came to the British government from a naval officer, Bernard Rawlings. This later portrait shows him in the Second World War. When the fighting broke out, he was one of the British representatives in Warsaw and was sent by his superiors to find out what was happening. In it happening. He went to Teshin, spoke to the Poles, arranged a ceasefire, crossed the firing line, spoke to Crossfield, and then went to Prague to talk to the Czechoslovak president. Rawlings reported back to Paris that the Czechs had deliberately attacked Teshin. He also reported Crossfield's involvement in the deception that justified the attack. Rawlings wrote that Crossfield stated that whilst the Allied officers had presented the ultimatum to the Polish commander by request of the Czechoslovak government, his own idea was that the effect on the Poles would be such that they would be willing to negotiate and that therefore unnecessary bloodshed would be avoided. British diplomats were very unhappy with Czech behaviour and also with Crossfield's behaviour. He was called back to London, but no disciplinary action was taken against him. This may be because parts of the British government had known in advance what was about to happen and allowed Crossfield to be involved. Or the authorities did not know in advance but decided it would be a bad idea to discipline Crossfield because it would draw unwanted attention to his behaviour. So what can we say about British policy towards Teshin before the Seven Day War? Not very much. The British government did not know much about Teshin and what they did know was biased towards the Czechoslovak position. So the crisis found the British playing catch-up. What we also see in the files in the weeks after the war in uh, mid-ranking officials, especially military ones, saying yes, the Czechs were wrong to attack, but they have some valid reasons. The Seven Day War put Teshin at the top of the diplomatic agenda in Paris for a short period. What we then see is much greater discussion amongst British officials about the situation in the duchy. Information, especially about the ethnic mix, is collated from existing sources and analyses can be conducted by diplomats and military officers. Again, we see a pro Czech bias and also concerns about the spread of Bolshevism which was used by the Czechoslovak government to justify their occupation of Teshin. But more importantly, in mid-February, Britain got some eyes on the ground. Lieutenant Colonel Basil Coulson was sent as part of the Inter-Allied Commission. Coulson worked with his French, American and Italian colleagues to send reports back to Paris but he also sent messages that were only for the British delegation. Coulson had been selected for the role because he could speak German. He was also upper class and reactionary. Therefore, we see two things in his initial reports. First, he interacted a lot with the German minority and he put forward their political suggestions, especially in relation to the position of the Silesian People's Party. Second, he was not impressed by the Polish army and so suggested that the Czechs would be better able to keep order and hold back Bolshevism. This imagined Bolshevik threat fitted with Colson's worldview and also intersected with the interests of the German elite. But what is interesting 
is that the British delegation in Paris did not buy into Coulson's view of the situation. In the files, we see mid-ranking diplomats and military officers disagreeing with Coulson's analysis, especially when Coulson became one of the main advocates for Teshin becoming an independent statehood. This idea was completely rejected by the peace conference, and it was decided by the British that Coulson should be replaced by another officer. The British delegation in Paris also came to a policy position of supporting the partition of Teshin. But even after this point, we can still detect pro-Czech sentiment within the British internal discussions. To bring this paper to a conclusion, after March 1919, <coughs> it is harder to find a specific British policy decision. Another British officer, Ridley Packen and Walsh, arrived in Teshin and eventually replaced Coulson. Packen and Walsh's reports are more cautious and he seems more even-handed with regard to the Poles and Czechs. So looking across British policy in this early period, it is clear that once the fighting stopped, there was limited public interest in Teshin. This allowed the British to focus on strategic and economic aspects of the situation because they did not have much political pressure. However, it is also clear the British officials, for many reasons that I have not had time to unpack, always defaulted to a pro-Czech position. And Crossfield's early reporting, fed in through the Secret Service, may have been an influence upon that preference. Overall, the British were always playing catch-up with Teshin. They had heard of the duchy, but they had not heard enough about it to formulate timely and distinctive policies. That concludes my paper. Thank you for your attention and apologies again that I could not address the conference in person.